Uh, hey, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Um, so this is my presentation on Tenor et al. 2015, entitled Soil Carbon Accumulation and CO2 Flux in Experimental Restoration Plots, Southern Iceland, Comparing Soil Treatment Strategies. So this was done by Dr. Tanner, um, Kristen Spavazdotir, and Olafur Arnolds. So a little bit of background information, um, just so we all are on the same page. Uh, CO2 flux is a common thing talked about in this paper, um, and that is the movement of CO2 out of the soil. And uh, weighted percent carbon is the amount of carbon in the evolved gases once soils go through a combustion analysis. So both of these are very important for the paper and for the carbon cycle in general. So just a little bit of an introduction. Um, so the purpose of this experiment was to study the rates and limits of soil carbon sequestration. Um, this is a study that builds off the two previous ones done earlier, um, Arnold's et al. 2013 and Otto Dottier et al. 2008. They all examine the same thing um, and they all have the same experimental questions. Um, so the first one is which type of soil treatment traps the most carbon? which type of soil treatment is most effective for restoring vegetation coverage. And in this iteration of the research, um, how does this compare to previous studies? Um, so the team's original hypothesis was that specific soil treatments done would be more effective in sequestration yields and vegetation coverage than the control, which was uh, which had nothing done to it. So this research is important for a variety of reasons. First and foremost is that it focuses on ecosystem restoration. Um, the team focused on an area in Iceland heavily impacted by erosion. This was through cattle grazing and deforestation. Um, and it provides a long-term outlook. Um, these three successive iterations of the research project provide um, change in over time which plants sequester the most carbon and which yield the most vegetation cover and by extension which restore the ecosystem most efficiently. Um, that being said, this final iteration of the research caps um, research done over a course of 12 year period. So as previously mentioned, this research builds off of two works done previously. The first work was out of Dotier et al. 2008. And this started with the sampling of 40 plots, each one hectare in size. And this was done at the Gita Sandor Restoration Research Area. Um, so they started with 40 plots originally, but wind deposition compromised the results of most of those. And in turn, they were left with only 10, um, 10 one hectare plots across all three research iterations. Um, so for their sampling, they had four different soil treatments. One was the control where they did nothing. Um, two was a treatment where they used fertilizer and seeded grass. Three was where they used fertilizer, seeded grass, birch, and willow trees. And then four was they used lupine. Their control was given two plots, uh, one hectare plots. Um, they had three one hectare plots for the fertilizer and seeded grass. They had three one hectare plots for the fertilizer, seeded grass, birch and willows, and they had two one hectare plots for the lupine. Um, so each of the plots had varying amounts of coverage, all impacted by the type of treatment that the team used for that plot. So at each plot, a randomly selected 10 by 10 meter subplot was made. Samples were taken from the four corners and the center of each subplot. The team extracted a 20 centimeter long and three centimeter diameter soil core for analysis. Um, and on the right, you can see that's kind of what the tool they would use for soil, um, soil extraction. Um, the team split the analysis of the layers, or the team split the analysis of the cores into two layers. Um, the first was at a depth of zero to five centimeters. This was called layer A. And the second was layer B at a depth of five to 10 centimeters. 
to analyze CO2 flux, the team used the LICOR LI-8100A soil gas chamber system. This measured CO2 composition uh, for 90 straight seconds in their sample with 45 second refractory periods. Um, what was also essential to their analysis was the creation of a linear regression line measured in units of micromoles of CO2 per meter second squared. So soil organic carbon content was analyzed using the combustion analysis through the Lico TrueSpec CN machine. Um, the weight percent carbon was calculated from the composition of evolved gases caused by the combustion analysis. So one of the issues that came up in their uh, experiment was, as mentioned before, the um, a large amount of their soil samples being compromised because of uh, wind blowing of the soils. So the team instead looked at raw organic carbon content um, in the soil to compare from the two studies in the past to the present, as opposed to their calculations. Um, so to analyze the statistical significance of the present research, the team used the null hypothesis test. Um, their null hypothesis was that the amount of carbon an experimental plot stores is less than or equal to the control plot. Their alpha was 0 0.05. In the present research, it was found that the control plots had the lowest carbon content at 0.36 kilograms per square meter. The fertilizer and seeded grass plots had a slightly higher amount of carbon stored in them. However, it was not statistically significant because the p-value was 0.22, and that was above their alpha, which was 0.05. That led to a failure to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that the control had sequestered more carbon. The carbon content for these plots was 0.38 kilograms per square meter. So slightly above the 0.36, but not statistically significant to say that the fertilizer and seeded grass treatment sequester more carbon. Um, so the grass birch willow plots had levels of carbon that were statistically higher than both previously mentioned treatments. The carbon content for this treatment was estimated at 0.52 kilograms per square meter. In the end, the lupine plots had the highest carbon content at 0.61 kilograms per meter squared. This was largely in part to the higher amount of carbon stored in layer B instead of layer A. So three of the four treatment types yielded similar rates of CO2 flux. The control, sea to grass, and grass birch willow all produced fluxes ranging from 0.5 to 0.6 micromoles per meter second squared. Meanwhile, the lupine treatment had a flux of, uh, of 2.9 micromoles per meter second squared. Um, something unique about the lupine findings is that they were the only treatment that exhibited a st statistically significant relationship between flux and CO2 content and were, were both increased at the same time. So as you can see, there's a variety of different trends um, in carbon soil content percentage for the four different treatments. As you can see in the control treatment, um, there is, it stays at moderately the same rate for 2005 to 2007, but then increases from 2007 to 2012. Um, the seed to grass treatment increases from 2005 to 2007, and then sharply decreases from 2007 to 2012. The grass birch willow um, treatment increased from 2005 to 2007, and it still increases from 2007 to 12, but at a much slighter and lesser rate. Um, at first, researchers believed that grasses were the most effective way for um, ecosystem restoration and carbon sequestration. However, the results in this graph show that lupine is the most effective at carbon sequestration in the long run, with the highest carbon soil percentage um, out of all of them in 2012. In a qualitative observation, it was indicated that lupine had far greater amount of above ground biomass than the other three treatments. Um, this is coupled also with the fact that lupine had an increased amount of 
root mass. Um, this in turn is what the researchers believe to increase CO2 flux and accounts for the positive correlation between CO2 uh, soil carbon content and flux. Um, in comparison to the other treatments, lupine brings the most vegetation coverage over time as well. And this was seen in the first iteration and second iteration when all four treatments increased in vegetation cover within the first couple of years. But after four years, the other, uh, the other treatment types began to peter off and lupine was the only one that was constant throughout um, the whole study. So the relationship studied by this team over the three successive uh, research efforts fluctuated due to the unique properties of each treatment. For example, as mentioned before, based on the research of the first two inter uh, intervals, um, they believe that grass was able to se sequester the most carbon and um, by that extension, um, build the most vegetation coverage and restore ecosystems most efficiently. However, over this recent in, uh, interval in 2012, it was shown that lupine is the most effective at carbon sequestration, increasing vegetation coverage and ecosystem restoration. So this research brings up several questions, both directly and indirectly. Um, first is, will the usage of lupine in ecosystem restoration lead to biodiversity loss? Will lupine overtake native vegetation species um, where it needs to heal soils that were affected by erosion? Um, and then the second question was, um, can the usage of lupine to sequester carbon lessen the impacts of climate change? I wonder how much um, land needs to be restored for any of this impacts to happen. So these are my sources. Um, I hope everyone's staying safe and have a good day.